What's up, everybody? What's going on? Welcome back to the Agostino's English Show, episode number 120. With me, your host, Agostino. What's up? What's really going on? What's good? Hope you guys are well, well rested, well hydrated, well lubricated and limble or loose, agile. You know, you've got your mobility back on. I know I'm feeling rough as two feathers. Specifically because I came back from a little run this morning and Pacific and um, alternatively because I had a bit of a long weekend. Um, not very much a party weekend, but much of a, you know, just hanging around and um, recovering from like Friday and Saturday's events. But so far, so good. Today started off really well. Nice, fresh run. Nice, healthy breakfast. And I'm here sitting in front of this little tiny camera and talking to you lovely people and through this lovely microphone so i hope everyone's well have a nice weekend and yeah let's get right into it ah so this weekend kind of brought to a close my four week uh back to back to back to back to back playing at um tapis so i think this has been the first month that i've played like every single weekend in um in a month right um in any given month so every single so every single friday of the given month right so um yeah, specifically for October, I played every single Friday at Tap East. The other months past, I've had a couple of holidays in between. The other, um, Natalia, aka Afro Musa, she's been away some couple of times, and there's been times when I've not been around. So this is the first month where I played actually every single Friday in the month, and it was um, a very revealing um, time of me playing because I think number one towards i think towards the end of september leading into the beginning of october i started to realize quite quickly that i needed to probably change job if i needed to do this if i needed to continue djing every friday or if it got or if it got to a point where i started to get a little bit more known and i started getting booked in other places and i was required to play more friday saturday gigs i had to get another job i had to get a job that allowed me to work monday to friday because unfortunately I work now in a job, well, the job that I've, I'm kind of coming to an end now, which, you know, every, everything else, everything else in the company is awesome. But I think just the shift pattern itself probably doesn't work for me and my schedule right now. It works in one way because, you know, like um, I can start really late. I can, there's two shifts open. You can start from nine or you can start from 12. And if you start at nine, you're in at six. And if you start at 12, you're in at 830. So the shift patterns are pretty good. Yeah, you, you can do it if you want to. But um, for me, if I'm working, if I'm DJing on a Friday and Saturday, doing shift work, which means you have to leave yourself open to working on the weekends, just isn't going to be something that can be sustainable. I can do it for like six months, but if it's any longer than that, I'll start to break. And even within those six months, there might be cracks showing in my mental psyche that kind of popped up in the last few months. So if anything, I'm quite thankful that I was able to like, you know, um, go through a sucky time and but then realize what I need to do because sometimes you know it can be hard for people to realize what the next step is when they're not doing anything right because sometimes the best decisions are made off the back of a shitty experience sometimes in life that's what usually happens right you go through a shitty time you meet a shitty person you do a shitty job you go to a shitty place and you realize you know what I'm not gonna go back here again you might not know what you like but you know exactly what you don't like so now that I've kind of figured it out onwards and upwards so that's been pretty revealing so it's kind of allowed me it's kind of forced me to change um kind of career paths or occupations for the most part let's say job let's say not career park i'm not looking to like stay in these places for a gazillion years but let's say it made me change my occupation my nine to five and it also allowed me during this kind of um, transition from like going from djing every other week to every week it also quickly made me realize how quickly it made me realize how essential it is to play out in front of people because I was for a long time when I wasn't getting booked regularly and I was playing like, you know, incrementally, I don't know. It was a bit sporadic. I was playing maybe once every two or three months. I had this kind of thought in my head that oh, as long as I'm practicing at home and I'm doing DJ and I'm kind of recording my DJ sets and uploading them onto SoundCloud, MixCloud, whatever it may be, then I'm fine, right? I just needed, what I basically used to do was I used to kind of like go online. I'd kind of scour the different forums and different kind of websites like Juno and all those kind of places, for like a record, blah, blah, blah look for some of the biggest songs that are playing that on that kind of week or in that kind of month and basically make a compilation and then put that into a mix and upload it, right? So just to show that, you know, I can play what's happening currently. I can play old shit, blah, blah, blah. Just to kind of show my range. But um, now I realize that, you know, club mixes or in situ, like in the actual environment that you're meant to be in are completely different to what you upload online. 
like completely different. It's like it's like night and day. It's just, it's essentially like you know when people say about footballers when they say they're not match fit. What they they don't mean that a person's like overweight or that he needs to lose ten pounds or whatever. It means that he's not got the match sharpness, right? He might he might have played a gazillion under twenty three games. He might have gone on loan to another club, but he's not match fit for that particular club on that particular level. He needs to kind of get acquainted to how it is to play at that pace with that, you know, with the lights on you, with the scrutiny, with people shouting and a game that actually matters, right? Because if you're playing reserve games, they, they, they matter, but they don't really matter in that respect. So sometimes there is a there is a kind of um, uh, in-club fit, right? Club fit kind of sort of thing, right? Um, where you haven't been, like, and I noticed in the beginning where I was quite rusty, I kind of got a little bit flustered sometimes when I was playing or a mix clanged, or I picked the wrong song, or like, yeah, I mean, you get a bit flustered, but now, having done it every week, I don't get flustered anymore, I just ride out the mistakes, so, okay, cool, no worries, I, I can reconcile this later, do you know what I mean, it led me to an interesting path, you kind of get less nervous, you hear a lot, of, I hear sometimes a lot of comedians say it too, where they kind of say, in the beginning, you get really nervous of silence, you don't want to, you don't want to have any silence, any like pauses, um, you don't want to say, um, a lot, you get a, you just you just start worrying about the wrong things, but with the more experience you get as a comedian, you start to kind of bask in the silence because you're you're showing the crowd that you're in control. You know what I mean? That you know exactly what you're doing, even when you don't know look like you know what you're doing. You know you try to act like you do, and that's essentially what I was doing. And um, it also it coincided with sober October, which I kind of finished preemptively a little bit sooner this weekend, which was probably a mistake. I'm um, thinking about it in the long run. But you know, I kind of did. Uh, I kind of did four weeks of it solidly, but it pre it kind of coincided with sober October, which also was a- allowed me to kind of explore DJing sober, which is a completely different thing that I'm used to. Because even if I don't drink too much when I'm t- DJing, I still maybe have a couple of drinks here and there. But this allowed me to kind of you know be a little bit more focused and just commit to actually doing the actual DJ job, which was you know difficult to do in the beginning. Don't get me wrong, like I mentioned a few times. Um, DJing in a bar surrounded by people that are slightly intoxicated or very intoxicated is not the most advantageous scenario to be in. I wouldn't advise it for people, but um, I'd say it's good to be in that environment because you start to realize quite quickly that you can manage it. It is manageable to do. It's not ideal, right? No one, no one that doesn't drink should want to go to a bar to hang out with people that are drunk. It's not really an ideal situation, but you can do it if you just want to hang out and be in that kind of ambiance with like dimly lit lights and candles on the table and talking to your friends and catching up and shit sometimes there is no other better place than a bar right it's a little bit more it's a there's a little bit less pressure on you socially because there's other people around it's a bit disarming it allows people to kind of relax a little bit blah 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 blah. right all the reasons that we all know exist um make it a good option but um I also realized that during that time that maybe my drinking during when I was DJing was a bit of a crux, right? Something that I could kind of rely on when I started to get nervous. Something that could kind of allow me to kind of get a little bit more relaxed, uh, to kind of, you know, enjoy myself a little bit more. And um, now I've realized, you know, me enjoying myself is me doing a good job, right? Is me making sure people are having fun. And the only way you can do that, I think, really well is to be sober in some respects. Yes, a little shot here and there might not help her, right? But what I was doing previously was I was drinking like I was going out, right? So I have I have pre drinks at home and all that sort of shit. And it doesn't sound, it doesn't, it sounds crazy. But when you're doing it, it doesn't sound that nuts, right? Because you have some drinks at home and you're preparing your mixes or you're putting together a playlist and you're uploading your USB, whatever it may be. And then you head out. And then by the time you head out, you haven't realized that you've had like I don't know four whiskeys and a couple of beers, right? And you're about to DJ. And then now all of a sudden you're like, oh shit. And then you get there and, and, and suddenly the kind of slight tipsiness you had before at your house kind of wears away. And you start to get nervous again. And then guess what you do? You get another drink to get, calm those nerves. And then that's what, like five drinks now. And all of a sudden you're like spiraling out of control. And, you know, it doesn't really work that well. Luckily I haven't been stupid. I haven't done anything dumb. But I'm sure um, the times I've DJed when I've drunk have been severely, have been not as good as the times I've DJed when I'm sober. I'm pretty sure of it because I'm more in tune with my surroundings. Um, I'm more able to kind of like take kind of chances and go left and right, right? And when I do it the other way, I'm not really that kind of person, um, has to be said. So that was really good and I really enjoyed myself. I think in general, I think it was such a, it was really fun. I have to be honest, it was really, really fun to DJ every week and have the opportunity to play 
don't really care if it's not that much money. Don't really care if it's not that many people that go there. I just think for me personally, selfishly, having been a big fan of underground electronic music, having promoted parties for years and years back in the day in Dalston and kind of did a bit of DJing beforehand, but that wasn't really to anybody because I used to do the alibi set from like, I don't know, not eight to like 10 or 11 when people got there. So I kind of missed out on people actually listening to my music that I'm playing, which was annoying. But having done all of that stuff, it's quite nice to kind of get the opportunity to kind of flex my DJ muscles. And, you know, I think I have a, I think I have a point of view. I think I have a sound that's a bit different than everyone else is playing out there. I think giving the opportunity to play in an actual, you know, proper nightclub, I think I'd absolutely smash it now more so than I would have done before. I think I'm probably a lot better than most people that have, you know, are commanding high fees or who are generally surviving being a DJ and playing in, you know, decent places i think i'm a lot better than most of them i'm probably a little bit more dynamic a little bit more um, interesting overall but you know it's a it's a process you know you just have to kind of like grind it out do your sets and reps and slowly but surely you kind of get i'll kind of get where i need to get to but at the moment i'm loving it for being a hobby that people are paying me to do like it's such a privilege to do to be honest i'm having a hobby that involves other people and bring a smile to their face and making them dance and also being paid for it like it's a nominal fee you know it can, it can cover an uber and maybe a few drinks later when i go out or something or it can cover a meal on the way home so it's not you know it's not fucking crazy money but it's good to be compensated to that sort of stuff and to have an opportunity to play some music i'm all for it so yeah it's been a interesting um experience but something that i really really savor and something i'm super fortunate i got the opportunity to do um moving forward sober october ended for me this weekend i had to i had to kind of decide when i wanted to end it early because i'm i'm leaving my job um, that I'm working my 9 to 5 tomorrow, which is Tuesday. So um, effectively, that'll be a day before Sober October, which is on the 31st. And I just didn't want to be on my leaving party, telling everyone I'm not drinking and then having them ask me a million questions. I just, you know, it's just annoying, like socially. Like I've, if anyone has been in that situation, you know how annoying it is. So I kind of had to decide, well, should I, should I do it this weekend on that? So I just decided to do it on a Friday which was quite cool. I just drank on a Friday and that was it. I didn't drink on a Saturday, which again, I think that it shows the the power of doing Sober October and maybe the power also of like doing a diet but having no cheat days. So trying to do a diet for the whole 30 days. It shows that what happens is that when you didn't do a cheat day, number one, you obviously the, the food doesn't taste as, the processed food doesn't taste as good as you think it does. And then you don't end up eating as much as you thought you would eat. So I, I drank on a Friday. I had a couple of drinks on a Friday, not that many. Uh, maybe uh, maybe about four in total so i had a couple of whiskeys no a whiskey at home a couple of whiskeys in the bar and then a whiskey again at fold and that was it so about four drinks i think overall in total in total so much so that even on the way home i was a bit tipsy and i bought some beers on the way home or a couple of tins of beers and i didn't even drink them there was a, and they're still there in my fridge you know I mean? that shows like the kind of development i've made over the because the, those drinks they got finished on saturday when i was watching football or on the sunday as well so that didn't happen so yeah i ended up finishing sober october on the friday took a couple of drinks and um yeah it's it's been pretty good like and again like i said i think it's made me more enthusiastic to try out doing a diet for 30 days without a cheat day and then see how you feel afterwards because i usually do a five a, let's say six days of a diet and then i do a cheat day on a sunday or something or on a saturday or something so i kind of do that kind of spread out so monday to friday kind of stick to your diet and then kind of go crazy on a saturday and then kind of go back on it again on sunday um saturday's not as crazy as it is as it as, as it seems like you, i try and have a good breakfast in the morning so a couple of scrambled eggs and some bacon or some spinach whatever it may be and then i'll have like for my lunch for my sorry for my lunch or dinner then i might go and get a burger i might have a pizza or whatever maybe but i try not to have a cheat day I try to have like a cheat meal so i don't you know lose so i don't um end up um binging too much but yeah um i could have probably got away with not drinking on the Saturday and just done it on the f on the Tuesday of my last day at work. Because overall, it, it didn't kind of pan out to be the night that I envisioned overall. It was good, don't get me wrong, but it didn't kind of go the way I thought it would. Like going out and getting fucked up. I wasn't really in the mood to do that, I think. Um, I don't know why. I'm not too sure why. But overall, um, yeah, so I, I went, what did I do? Oh, so Friday DJed, which was pretty good. Good set on, D on Friday. Quite a lot of people came out, I'm assuming because it was payday. And everyone was out after work having a drink. And it's kind of cold. So people just want to man staying inside the bar for a bit and having a bit of a good time. Then I decided to go to Fold to see Bubba Stilts play. And Fifi, Claire and all those other people. It was really good, man. Um, it was a bit of a bummer that... <coughs> so about the overall night. 
I got to the folder like about one, I think, after I finished kind of packing up the stuff out. Um, um, I tapped, I tapped East, sorry, and then getting a, a fucking Uber all over, over there. I called and got there for about one. Ended up having to queue for about 20 minutes. It was really cold. I don't know why they made us queue because by the time we got in, there was hardly anyone in there. Wasn't it wasn't full, it wasn't empty, but it was like kind of like three quarters of the way full. So if you've ever been to fold, the it was full up until the door. It was it was packed up until the door that leads to go to a smoking area. So the bit from the smoking area all the way to the person that does a sound was kind of completely empty. You could you could basically like you know swing, swing a cat and you wouldn't hear anyone. So I got in there and Baba Sauce was playing. I think he played from like I think he played from like one till four or one till or twelve till four. One of those, one, I think it might have been 12 to 4. So when I got there, he already started playing. He was playing a really deep, a really um, eclectic, not deep, I said really eclectic, like housey sort of sound, like the kind of stuff that you know the Bible sort of play, um, kind of similar to his boiler room sets. Um, very, um, very sort of melodic, deep, because um, deep, dark, sort of like house kind of sounds, like, you know what I mean? So that was really good. See him do his textbook, like, you know what I mean? Um, mosh pit, shaking his hair all upside down, left and right. Uh, very very good set for the first couple of hours and then he took a really fun interesting weird turn and started playing loads of hip-hop loads of bashment which was fucking cool to see so sometimes you get a lot of those some surprises i remember someone telling me one <coughs> they went to see local dice play at nabi for something for an after party and he was playing like a super hard techno set and then he noticed there was loads of lads around like i don't know like boys from like you know the enzo around um when they were, like you know what I mean? scan can have a good time and he just dropped a milli on them do you know what i mean and they went absolutely nuts like that kind of ability to kind of like take a left turn <clears throat> and kind of pull another group of people inside the party that was fucking cool so he managed to do that um it was funny again seeing you know a bunch of uh caucasians trying to dirty wine with that stuff that was quite interesting um but yeah the the bashment was really good <clears throat> but interestingly he started playing bashment to intro his basement set, he played um, Playboy Carty, Poke It Out, featuring Nicki Minaj. That was a fucking awesome. So I was like in a toilet. Like, dun, dun. You know the beginning of Poke It Out? Bad bitch. Uh, uh, talk it out. Poke it out. Da, 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 da. So imagine after the, all that house and techno things in the beginning, he then switches and plays that to bring in the basement. I was like, wow, masterful. So... As you can tell, I wasn't as fucked up as I as I intended to be because I remember quite a lot of the set. I was kind of like chin stroking, and I was trying not to be a chin stroker on the sides because I know that image people don't really like for people that go to um, nightclubs and just watch the DJ play and kind of write down his track list. But I was trying to have a mental note of the kind of turns he was taking, you know, because he's like a professional, so he kind of gets paid to do this. So I was interested to see like the kind of guts or the guile, or the confidence it takes to kind of like play. A house and techno set in that environment in Fold, which is a very, you know, a dark, a, a kind of an English version of the Bergheim. Um, and then he kind of decided, you know what, fuck it. Let me play some hip hop. Let me play some bashment. Let me, let me play some, you know what I mean? He took some, he took some really, really good risk in there. So that was really good to see. And then by the time it hit four and everyone else started to play, everyone basically left for the most part. And by eight, five or five thirty, it was completely empty and no one was around. Man. It was kind of. Yeah, I guess a bummer, man. If you're a DJ playing right at the end, no one was there. Everyone kind of left. And I think it was a girl that was playing. I'm not too sure who the girl was. Um, she was playing towards the end, a blonde girl. And there was really no one there to see her play um, between like five and six. And the night ended. And then, yeah, um, I, I, I spoke um, briefly to somebody at Fold who was kind of like, you know, part of the crew, helping out and stuff. And I was wondering because I have I've been checking for um, events page on Resident Advisor time to time. And I've noticed there's not been that many 24 hour parties, right? Because when Fold launched, it was billed as a London's new 24 hour venue, right? So I went to the opening of Fold and it was fucking amazing. They they did a good job of inviting like some of the biggest promoters from London to come and DJ like an hour or an hour and a half um there and they play some of the best stuff i've heard in a while everything from trance to gabba sort of stuff uh electro to house to techno it was insanely eclectic um so that opening night fold was probably one of the best parties I've, I've been to in london overall especially for an opening of a club the atmosphere was electric everyone was kind of in there celebrating the, the dawn of a new era but there was also some criticism when it after the party finished with a lot of people saying um which was true kind of evidence to the night that because they had so many other DJs playing there, it was a bit messy. The set list, right? It was it went it, it went there was too many swings. There wasn't a kind of common theme running through some of the people were playing and they were playing for too short, uh too short of a set, blah blah blah. 
and then as a as the kind of a programming of fold evolved it kind of transpired that maybe they were relying too much on promoters to bring in a crowd and not the club itself so they were kind of relying on promoters to kind of bring people into the venue which then would lead to the programming being a little bit scattergun because you know you're just getting people in that are going to bring bodies into the actual space um which doesn't maybe necessarily fit the overall vision long term and that's what um that's what uh, Bergheim and places like uh, places like the school in Amsterdam do a good job of doing, right? And Robert Johnson in Frankfurt, where um, you go to the club first. Even Fabric in London has a good reputation of that. You go to the club itself, and then the DJs come second. Even a small example, mini, mini, mini example will be Visions and maybe Alibi, right? Visions, you knew exactly what you're going to get. It says exactly what it says, doesn't attend. Like, you know you're going to have hip-hop. For the most part, even Living Proof, I don't think people go to see Snips or Rags play, right? I don't think people give a fuck what, who's going to be there. They just know it's a hip-hop party. It's one of the best hip-hop parties in London. Um, so you go to hear them play, and if you hear Snips and Rags play and they're good, okay, whatever, that doesn't matter. But sometimes, and those are club nights as well. That's a club night itself. It's not even a, a, cl a club or a bar um, in the same way Visions or Alibi was. But that's essentially what Fold should be trying to do. Now, that's me speaking from the outside looking in. I'm not an expert. I don't know anything about uh, programming a club or establishing a club. But in order to kind of for it to last, in order to kind of build an actual reputation that people can kind of trust and go in week in, week out, especially being in the middle of Canning Town, which is probably a little bit far for most people, I think it does need to have a programming that kind of like, you know, is just like the best programming in London um, for the most part, but you're going to see fold. you're going to fold. You're not going to go and see a DJ or a promoter play. If you look through the listings on Resident Advisor, just look at the pictures themselves. They're all different artwork. Different artwork essentially means it's a, it's a different promoter. When, whereas if you go to Berkheim Resident Advisor page or you go to um, Robert Johnson Resident Advisor page, you'll see the same artwork during the month or during the week, which then kind of like. And then when you click on it, you see it's a theme like you know Res Robert Johnson presents blah blah blah, where they get a where they get certain DJs in to kind of curate a certain sound. Now it might be that they're getting promoters to kind of they might be it might be Robert Johnson or Bergheim fronting the lineup, and then they got promoters actually programming it, assessing the people. But that's what that it, that's even a better option because then at least you get the pro the promoters to kind of program the months of programming similar to what um london warehouse um projects or london warehouse um in entertainment whether lwe did with uh, the print works when it first opened if you look at print works when it first opened to the lineup now the lineup when it first opened was a little bit more it you know there was a little bit more to it than what it is now now it's a bit bait but before you could see that you know london warehouse projects london, those people that do with the warehouse people they did a very good job of programming that lineup and they kind of picked people that kind of fit the space and there was a kind of theme to it. It kind of made sense from the last week to the previous to the week coming up. There was a kind of, there, there was a rhyme and reason to it. Whereas now Fold doesn't feel like it and having spoken to the dude um, who will go unnamed who was at Fold, he basically said that they're, they're finding it, number one, they're finding it hard to fill the space so they're not giving out many 24-hour licenses because they're not, they're not, they're not, they haven't been able to kind of justify the overheads, right? Because, a 24-hour license means that you're going to have a change in shift um, of security guards or bartenders or people that are on the door. So you, you can't necessarily do it if people are not actually there in the club, right? Because you don't have enough money. You don't make enough money at the bar to pay the staff, which is annoying, right? Um, so that didn't happen. And um, so now they've got, essentially, they've got, I think they've got one license a month for 24-hour club, but they haven't used it in a while because... No one's been able to guarantee the numbers. So that's been a bit sad. I'm assuming it's going to be a lot better at New Year's Eve. I'm assuming they're going to have a, probably a good party there. But still, they haven't announced anything. And, you know, we're already heading into November and there's nothing been announced. So that was a bit of a bummer to see, like, how empty it was, especially considering how popular. Or maybe, again, I don't know if it Bubba Stilts is like, a, you know, a lot of those DJs, a lot of people in general are quite popular on the internet, but don't necessarily um, translate in real life. Uh, a rapper, a rapper called Designer is a good example, right? He had a he had a one he had a big hit in Panda, and then couldn't re really replicate it because he didn't really have a fan base. And then when he did finally put out a project, it was quite underwhelming. And you know the fans that were there kind of ditched him for the most part. So he's not someone that's going to fill an arena or set out tour dates. So maybe Baba Stilts isn't as popular as I thought it would be, but I think he was quite. To be honest, there was quite a lot of young people out there who came, who made the effort to go out and see him play in the middle of Canning Town. I'm sure a lot of those kids don't live anywhere near Canning Town, so they made the effort to come and see him. So I'm sure Baba Stilts is popular, but you know, I was I was a little bit disappointed to see how empty it was overall. Um, I'm not sure if the clubbing community or people that are interested in electronic music don't have necessarily grown up and don't really care about going to nightclubs anymore. I know for me, 
mm. Percy speaking um, and having um, been out a few times, I know if there was a bar that existed, right, that was, um, you know, a quite nice, cosy bar, had a good space to dance, but for the most part, pretty small, maybe, maybe let's say, um, the size of just a bit, the, you know, the, the probably just probably like can fit maybe like let's say 150 people inside it right if there was a bar like that that had a dj playing a corner who necessarily wasn't playing stupid stuff but playing like good stuff they got like an actual good dj to come in or it was it was a spot that was well connected with people in the industry so if a DJ, if like jamie jones came into town and had a couple of hours to spare before he set he wanted to kind of play a couple of tunes he could it was like a cool space to be in right and you kind of promote local people and stuff um I would probably go there as opposed to going to like a national nightclub, right? And you got to know the owner and you can have a lock-in afterwards. That would probably be a bit, bit, a bit more fun. So maybe there's a more people, there's more people out there who kind of have the same thinking as me. And also there's been a very big upsurge or there's been a very big demand and interest in people doing parties in warehouses and in alternative spaces and in the forest during this year because we had one of the best summers we've had in the UK overall. So a lot of people were kind of raving outside, raving in warehouse spots and like, you know, big doing the whole BYOB thing. So that was <clears throat> that was something that kind of took a hold, especially off the, off the back of the whole Hackney licensing law stuff, right? Where loads of bars and clubs within the Shoreditch and Hackney area were, um, especially the new ones opening, were required to close at, I think, 12 during the weekends and 11 during weekdays. So which kind of effectively crushed a lot of their business and uh, maybe dampen a lot of people's hopes uh, uh, of London becoming a real 24-hour city. So I do remember the guy for Pacific is saying that London isn't ready quite yet for what they have, which makes sense, right? I'm not someone to shift. I, I don't like the whole shifting blame saying, oh, the customer doesn't get it, but there is something about London not getting it just yet, right? There is an idea that, you know, kids going there already quite smashed, um, not kind of pacing themselves, and then, you know, not really understanding what a 24-hour party is about, um, and just generally, you know, this the kind of culture overall of like having DJs play one hour sets or two hour sets, you know, you need someone to kind of play a little bit longer, you need the crowd to kind of trust the DJ, blah, 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 blah. So again, um, that's what kind of led to the weekend being a bit of a bummer. And me thinking, you know, I probably could have got away with not drinking on that Friday and just doing it on a Tuesday, uh, day before October, October ended. But, you know, you have to make your decisions and kind of live with them at the end of the day but yeah that was it fold maybe isn't going as well as it probably should have maybe it needs some more time to kind of grow and mature maybe some punters need time to kind of you know um adopt it and kind of you know give it time as well to grow and trust it and kind of back it maybe they're doing a wrong job in terms of hiring promoters to curate the nights and not kind of bring it in in house and having themselves kind of program nights and maybe they don't have the money to do it i don't know blah 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 to hire the djs but hopefully soon we kind of see a change and they kind of do end up um being a bit more of a success going forward um i'm really fingers crossed i don't want i don't want i don't want it to close man but yeah it wasn't as far as i intended i hoped it would have been but yeah um apart from that pretty decent weekend i think um what else i need to oh one more thing before i decide to call this a day i saw this actually and i thought this was quite cool so this is a bottle designed by the legendary designer um felix stark right he designed a beer bottle which is i just saw this on hype this morning called uh stark uh stark beer so s it was stark beer basically for the most part so um, I, I like the design of it. I remember when I was in university and I was doing a product design at Central St. Myers. I remember we had a project that I really got enthusiastic about. Which I think we had a design project um, to, for, for Heineken to redesign a bottle. I think they do it every year. It's like a student thing. And I really like the idea because I remember that was during a time when I was going to a lot of the Thursday um, gallery openings sort of thing, right? Where they have give you free drinks and free beer. And I remember, and I remember just thinking... Um, like a designer and trying to think what would be a good idea in terms of a bottle design right um that would work well in that kind of scenario because you need a bottle design that you can kind of you need the design of a bottle that isn't too big where um you, you need something that's not too big where you're kind of cumbersome and you can't really move around and look at the artwork you need something that's small enough that you can maybe hold in your hand if you're having a long chat or you can put in your back pocket if you're trying to roll up a cigarette or something right you need you need certain things um to work in a bottle for it to be kind of like re to work really well in that kind of environment so i was kind of thinking more along those kind of lines right what, what would work 
really well during an event or during a store opening or a gallery um, evening. And I thought a long, I thought really long about um, the neck of a beer bottle, how you're specifically holding it. Like most people hold the, for me, you know, personally, I usually hold it to the top, which, you know, maybe is a bit, a bit counterintuitive because it means that it's the less surface area. And if you kind of let go, the whole bottle drops and you don't have much opportunity to kind of grab it again. Whereas if you actually hold the bottle on this actually body where the main part of it is, you've got more chance to grab it if it kind of drops out of your hand. But I was just thinking in terms of, you know, if you're going to carry it in your hand after, if you're a gallery, it might be most sense to carry it for the top bottle. And I like this design of the Philip Stark bottle, beer bottle because it's got a really long neck. Kind of similar to like, you know, some olive oil bottles have that kind of really long neck, that kind of funnel that kind of you can uh, pour olive oil quite slowly into your salads or whatever it may be. And I, I like the design of it. I think this is really cool. Um, so it's got a pretty long neck on it at the top and it looks like a screw fix bottle cap. But again, I just like overall design of it. Ergonomically, I think it works really well and kind of reminded me a lot of the design I did in school. I'm not saying Philip Stark stole my design, but I'm not saying he might have not became inspiration from it. You know what I mean? No, but yeah, I like the design of it. I think it looks pretty cool. Um, it's available now, I think, to purchase, right? It's quite fairly cheap. You can buy it now at the Brasserie de Hotel web store and it costs 10 euros for three bottles. So a pretty cool bottle. Um, Philip Stark isn't like, I don't know, He's not like um so he's not like um what you call it, hype beast friendly like Tom Sachs or like Takashi Murakami, but he's one of the most influential product designers out there, or industrial designers in the world. So if you want to back something that isn't as hype as a, maybe a Carl Lagerfeld Coke bottle, then I definitely recommend you check out this. Super super cool. Anyway, this is a nice short and sweet one. I'm gonna come back again later for a longer episode, but I thought I'd kind of get this in there quickly. Um, there might be a bit of a lull in episodes, episodes actually as I move in between Joker. I've actually fixed my actual own laptop to kind of record these things on. And if not, I'll just maybe record an audio version of it and upload that instead. But this has been the Excellent English Show episode number 120. Thank you so much for tuning in as always. For more information regarding moi and all that malarkey, contact uh, pages and next DJ gigs and blogs and all that malarkey, uh, please check out my website, which is in the link below, which is axionzinger.com for all those nice infos. Support my uh, my podcast sponsor, which is Audible at audible.com forward slash Aggie. You get one free book credit and a 30-day free trial. You get to choose from over 400,000 titles. 400,000 book titles, and most of them are narrated by the actual author themselves, so it actually allows the book to come to life in your eardrums or through your bluetooth speaker or out of your phone however way you listen to it i recommend you check out my sponsor audible.com for us a double g g y and i'm gonna check you back again on the other side very very soon thanks for tuning in tuning out peace